Greetings from Emerge News and Heart Care Foundation of India. Welcome to the show, Chat with Dr. K.K. Today we have with us Dr. Mandeep Mehra, uh, who is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, executive director, Center for Advanced Heart Disease at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Harvard. Welcome to our show. Thank you very much. Uh, you are an expert in the field of heart failure. And we see that in India, we have an epidemic of diastolic heart failure. There was a time we only talked about, because in my medical college, diastolic heart failure was not known. Yes. We, we learned about it, and now we are seeing like an epidemic. Yes. At the age of 30, 40, when I'm doing an echo, yes. we are finding them having a yes. diastolic dysfunction. First, what is diastolic dysfunction? Two, mm -hmm. what are the reasons why in India specifically, yes. diastolic dysfunction is so rampant? Yes. So one of the, one of the most startling uh, new epidemiologic revelations is the fact that uh, the United Nations and the World Health Organization predicts that by the year 2020, the number of patients with incident and prevalent heart failure in India will outpace every other country. What's equally interesting from your question is the fact that almost half of these patients will suffer from diastolic heart failure. Now, what is diastolic heart failure? Well, we try to segregate left ventricular dysfunction into two types, systolic heart failure and diastolic heart failure. Systolic heart failure is when the heart muscle pump function is weakened in systole, in contractility. There's a contractile insufficiency. In diastolic heart failure, there is primarily a relaxation abnormality. And we now know that diastole is probably more energy consuming than is systole. And one can look at it uh, as an analogy, as like a rubber band. You know, it's very easy to pull the rubber band but it takes a lot more energy to, uh, yeah. So, so it's, um, it's, it's one of those issues where diastole and can be influenced early. We know from physiologic studies that diastolic dysfunction always precedes uh, systolic uh, dysfunction. So that's another thing we know. And that's why diastolic dysfunction likely can be uncovered much earlier in the course of the journey of heart failure. The most common uh, cause of diastolic heart failure worldwide, the most common cause, is hypertensive heart disease. Not obesity? Not necessarily. And I'll, I'll speak to that. Uh, so there's a, there's a paradox about obesity. The most common cause of attributable population risk uh, for heart failure is hypertensive, uh, I, I, uncontrolled hypertension. Now, obesity is the biggest emerging epidemic uh, with the westernization of, um, uh, of, of the Indian uh, society in many ways. I think we're seeing an epidemic of obesity. Because why I'm saying is because in our Indian, when I do my echocardiographic data setup, yeah, yeah. I see grade one and grade two diastolic dysfunction much more with obesity yes. than with hypertension because the number yes. is, the number of hypertension yes. is only 10%, 15%, yes. yes. obesity is 37, 38%. So yes. they outnumber the diastolic dysfunction. The question, of course, is, 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 are the targets of what we define hypertension accurate for Asians? Okay. One could argue, one could argue that, that, that the 140 over... 140, 90. I'm talking one, about yeah. stage one. If you're talking about 140, 90, it's very possible that in a shorter stature population, in an Asian with uh, established endothelial dysfunction, um, um, uh, insulin resistance, that, uh, that that degree of uh, blood pressure may be pathological. Okay. And, and, and we see that in different ethnicities. For example, if you take African Americans, at the same level of blood pressure, African Americans have more left ventricular hypertrophy Absolutely. and earlier diastolic dysfunction. Absolutely. But no one has focused on this issue in Asians. And I think, that, um, I think that you're absolutely right on. Uh, we need to try and understand ventricular and vascular coupling and uncoupling in hypertensive heart disease better in, uh, in Asian Indians particularly. Second issue that you brought up about obesity is fascinating because um, I personally have, uh, have done uh, some uh, research work in obesity-related heart failure. Uh, my group was the first to demonstrate that in the state of obesity, circulating levels of natriuretic peptide are suppressed. 
Okay. So that so that you generally generally if you look at natriuretic peptides, these are vasodilating molecules. They in fact have a, um, a vasodilating effect, um, and they are counter-regulatory to uh, adverse neurohormones. So in the state of heart failure, typically uh, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is hyperactivated. To counter that, the heart serves as an endocrine organ and produces natriuretic peptides, uh, predominantly from the left ventricle, partially from the atria, but 90% of the production is from the left ventricle. It, it sort of sweats out natriuretic peptides and they counterbalance the neurohormonal aberration. In, in the state of obesity, we have shown that given, um, uh, given this degree of heart failure, pound for pound, if you will, uh, uh, that, that the amount of natriuretic peptide uh, suppression is about 40%. So there's a circulating insufficiency of the counter-regulatory neurohormone. That's probably why we tend to see uh, heart failure occur earlier in obese patients. However, there's an extraordinarily interesting phenomenon that has been observed in obese patients with heart failure. If you take general populations and, and you draw a line and you say, once you reach the state of obesity, defined as a BMI of say 30 and above, once you reach that, the mortality curves are linear, they go up for, for cardiovascular disease, not in heart failure. Even though in heart we, failure, obesity is protective. Is protective. And, and so you actually have a U-shaped curve uh, occur at that it dips in, in obesity. So there's so much to learn. It is very clear that obesity results in earlier pickup of heart failure. No question about it. But it's also clear that somehow there's a protective effect. Okay. So, so this debate will continue. Of course. Uh, uh, diagnosis is not a domain of... Uh, an average doctor because he will send it for a cardiologist to get diagnosed. Yes. Let me concentrate on the treatment. Sure. Because there is a huge confusion how to treat a diastolic dysfunction. Yes. Say if I get an individual who is, uh, he says, when I walk, I get breathless. When I climb stairs, I get breathless. Yes. When I have relationship with my wife, I am more breathless than yes. normal. Absolutely. And he goes to a doctor and he does his echo and he says, grade one or grade two, I have yes. diastolic dysfunction. Yes. And there was a time we were taught that drug of choice is DLTSM or Verapamil. Yes, yes. But now lots of new drugs and new avenues have come. Yes. How do we treat diastolic dysfunction? So, great question. Uh, so, so the, the, one, of the, one of the most uh, important issues with diastolic heart failure and its therapy is the fact that most clinical trials that have been conducted, randomized controlled clinical trials, have all failed. And you say, how can it be? I mean, we understand the disease. What's the problem with it? Well, the first problem is that just because you detect a compliance abnormality on an echo doesn't mean the patient has heart failure. Okay. No, I'm not. So the first uh, why so is dysfunction second is the disease. Is the disease the failure? Absolutely. So I'm talking about both at the level so, of dysfunction at right. the level of failure. Right. So I was going to make a very important point, and that point is that a study done in the UK suggested that that when patients with so-called diastolic dysfunction present with signs and symptoms of what is perceived to be heart failure that 30% of the time, there is another mitigating diagnosis responsible for the shortness of breath. For okay, instance. maybe anemia, maybe... Anemia. Maybe anemia, maybe ischemic heart disease. Okay. Maybe just the obesity and thoracic cage uh, okay. restriction. I mean, it can be a lot of things. So step number one is make sure the diagnosis is right. Okay. Step number two is make sure you treat the factors that are positive, which is why I made the uh, important uh, recommendation blood that pressure. blood pressure. Blood pressure control. If you look at all the hypertension trials, the most important finding from the hypertension trials is that when you control blood pressure, the incidence of heart failure goes, goes down. Goes down by 40%. That's right. 40 to 50%. Exactly. So, so it, it's the most, most important message that we can pass. And which is why I made the point that we need to readdress what is a normal blood pressure for an Asian Indian, you know, and, and for a statue. For my patients, when I talk about I says keep your diastolic blood pressure lower than 80. That's what I do. Perfect. Perfect. That's exactly. Right. In fact, I have created a formula called Formula of 80. Keep I've, your I've lower that. blood pressure, fasting sugar, abdominal circumference, yes, yes. and then pulse rate, uh, and then fasting yes. sugar and yes. uh, bad cholesterol, all lower than 80 if possible. Fantastic. If possible. <laughs> so it's perfect. Perfect. What a, what a formula and, and what an easy way of uh, depicting it. So that's the first point. Second point is, of course, with obesity, one has to make sure that uh, you reduce the risk factor of obesity. Hard to do. Exercise. Uh, Indians are not used to and uh, uh, usually not used to a very active lifestyle. So, so from your point of view is that diastolic dysfunction, mm -hmm. which is asymptomatic mm -hmm. stage of uh, diastolic abnormality, mm -hmm. is reversible. By, Absolutely. By, by, so therefore, at that moment, we should risk it. Absolutely. That's in, in my own study, with my own patients, I've seen that if I reduce their 
uh, white sugar, white maida, and white rice. Mm -hmm. That means I take them off carbs yes. and take away their metabolic uh, insulin resistance, yes. their diastolic reversibility changes. Perfect. So that's one. Absolutely. If I have to give a drug, yeah. which drug? Okay. So, so the the most common reason why uh, these patients present symptomatically is is, is a congestive reason. Absolutely. Um, unlike in chronic heart failure. Where, where, where patients have exertional dyspnea after walking certain distances, which means it's not necessarily immediate dyspnea on limited exertion. Immediate dyspnea on limited exertion is, is because the pressures are increased, pulmonary congestion. That's diastolic dysfunction. That's diastolic dysfunction. So most of them will say that when I go to the bathroom, I'm breathless. I'm breathless, exactly. And so, when you do coronary, yeah. normal. And I call it idle or immediate dyspnea on limited exertion, and that's a hallmark. That means that you have to lower their pressure. So if you've controlled the systemic afterload, then the next step is to control volume. So volume control is very important in these patients. The only message I would say is that, so using a diuretic is extremely important. Um, the only message I would say uh, with that regard is that one has to be very careful not to overshoot. Because if you overshoot uh, volume reduction, you'll worsen the disease Absolutely. by neurohormonal activity. Absolutely. Now, um, there, there have been several studies, as you pointed out, done showing uh, lucitropic agents. Lucitropism is a terminology, just a, a Greek word for uh, relaxation. And lucitropic agents are agents like uh, diltiazem, verapamil, so the uh, negatively inotropic calcium channel blockers, or even beta blockers. Turns out that the data with these uh, in small studies has shown some benefit. But when you start looking at large cohorts, the data becomes very confusing. So what about aldactone? Huh? What about aldactone? Aldactone is being looked at. There's a trial called the Top Cat trial, which is being coordinated out of the Brigham. The results will be released at the ACC uh, next year in March. And then what about hydrochlorothiazide or indipamide? So I, 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 don't, I don't think there are studies with indipamide. So then what is the drug of choice today? Honestly, it's a diuretic right now, and which is why I think which the diuretic then? Oh I, uh, oh, I think furosemide, but in, in controlled quantities, and one has to be very careful uh, how much you use. The other issue is that, uh, so, so the, the three points we made is prevent it. Make sure the diagnosis is correct Absolutely. and that you've taken care of other mitigating Absolutely. factors. Ischemic heart disease being one, chronic pulmonary disease being another, and obesity being the third. These are the three commonest reasons why misdiagnosis occurs in this. And the third is to uh, use effective doses of diuretics and control blood pressure. Those would be the simplest ways of tackling, um, uh, uh, tackling uh, diastolic heart failure at this moment. Studies with um, uh, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers have all uh, shown no benefit. Uh, Some people, why not give ACE inhibitors in terms of reduce the, the left ventricular hypertrophy? Yes. And indirectly it will help yes. the diastolic function? Yes. So it just depends at what stage of the disease you're catching the patient. Okay. And one of, the, one of the biggest problems with clinical trials where they say, oh, you know, these drugs don't work in diastolic heart failure. One of the biggest reasons why, uh, why they fail is that they, they look at a very chronic population with advanced recurrent, uh, you know, diastolic uh, dysfunction and diastolic heart failure where they've sort of controlled the blood pressure, but these patients have comorbidities like COPD, diabetes. Diabetes is another big one, by the way. Di the combination of diabetes and hypertension are metabolically very, very negative uh, for, uh, for, for left ventricular relaxation, as you well know. Where did you leave India? Where, uh, Where did you leave India? Um, <laughs> well, that's a great, uh, that's a great question. Um, so I went, I went to the United States um, immediately after medical, uh, medical school, um, uh, mainly because I was recruited to move there by a professor of neurology from Ohio State University. My initial uh, foray was to become a neurologist. And I went to Ohio State, uh, worked there. And I realized in those days that, uh, uh, you know, of course, neurology has changed now, but I was simply a, a master diagnostician charting the natural history of uh, neurologic diseases. I became very fascinated by what was happening in cardiology. If you think about it, in the 80s, uh, Dr. Agarwal, cardiology was at an upswing. Thrombolysis was Thrombolysis coming, statins were being introduced, ACE inhibitors had just come on, 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 you know, so heart failure, prevention, atherosclerosis, there was a big, big um, uh, spike. So that fascinated you? It fascinated me. The opportunity for clinical discovery, the opportunity for teaching, all of these things uh, fascinated if me. If the Prime Minister of India calls you yes. and says, 
Mandeep come here and advise yes. me yes. to do something in the field of cardiovascular prevention. Yes. What would be your advice? Oh, my. Uh, so, so my advice would be that uh, we need to have a general strategy in the um, in India about increasing awareness about the complications of heart disease. So, I think I think we've done we've done quite a lot. You've, I mean, you you are uh, extraordinary. Why don't you think of a Why don't you think of a NRI cardiovascular control program in India? Oh, that means wow. yeah. involve all the NRIs, yeah. Yeah. create a program, yeah. and then when you create a yeah. program, the government will jump in hmm. with the funds. Today they are not. Right. So if you have a or if you have an NRI cardiologist, right. and, and people say that there are more cardiologists of Indian yeah. origin in US than in India, yeah. who are actually practicing cardiology, yeah. Yeah. why can't they think of a continuing with the yeah. consortium and doing something? Well, what a brilliant as idea. a program, not yeah. as yeah, no, no, no. not I, as giving money. Yeah, yeah, no, considering I, I, a program. I see it. I see it. Actually, providing uh, education and uh, increasing, Absolutely. enhancing awareness. Absolutely. Well, you obviously uh, are, if if I may say so, the master of um, of really. But alone, nobody uh, can do. It, it, there has to be a group who, well, who works. Well, it. somehow you see to do it because uh, you know I, I've been watching as I uh, as we talked earlier I've been watching what you've done with your CPR 10 program extraordinary I mean you, you know you're confronting one of the most important problems you you not only increase awareness but you have an effective intervention coupled with it and you've made it so simple CPR 10 Absolutely. I mean how wonderful you know, those are the kind of things we need in India. You know, one or two, three or four or five things like this. But but it requires a master clinician like yourself and a master educator like yourself to do it. If uh, uh, do you smoke? Oh no, no, never smoked. No, <laughs> your, your lifestyle is as what you advocate to the people. Absolutely. <laughs> so what we have uh, chat with Mandeep is that he says uh, I practice what I preach. And he says CPR should be learned by everybody. And one thing is very clear is that diastolic dysfunction is common. And to prevent diastolic dysfunction, you must control your blood pressure, you lower your diastolic blood pressure lower than 80, and control your obesity, specifically the pot belly obesity. So thanks, Mandeep, to be in our show. Thank you. And that's all for today. We'll come back with one more show next time. Till that. Bye -bye.